Hello everyone, this lesson is going to be on DNA technologies. This will be the first of two parts that I'll put together on DNA technologies. This one here, I'll talk about restriction enzymes, gel electrophoresis, polymerase chain reaction, and DNA fingerprinting. And in the next one that I'll just call part two, I'll talk about recombinant DNA technologies, genetic engineering, and gene therapy. So I'll start off here by talking about restriction enzymes. We've come across a whole bunch of enzymes already in our conversation with DNA replication, protein synthesis, transcription, and translation. Remember that enzymes, they are biological catalysts that typically are going to increase the rate of a reaction. So these restriction enzymes, what they do, as it shows in this picture, is they serve as molecular scissors, and what they do is they cut DNA. But they do a lot more, as we'll see, than just randomly cutting up the DNA into small pieces. They cut in a very specific way and at a very specific location. So these restriction enzymes, uh, the picture that we're taking a look at here, we can see uh, the fuchsia colored DNA in the background. So these restriction enzymes, just like some of the other ones that we've encountered, like the DNA polymerase or the RNA polymerase, they latch on to the DNA, they run along the length of the DNA, and they do different things. And in the case of these restriction enzymes, what they do is they stop when they recognize a very, very specific sequence of DNA, usually between four and eight bases in length, and once they do that, they make a cut to the DNA. So these restriction enzymes are not from our bodies, they're not from humans, they're not even from plants and animals, where they're actually from, where they have been found in, and this goes back to the late 1960s, early 1970s, where they first discovered these, as they're found in bacteria. And as I have here, what they do is they restrict the functionality of foreign DNA in bacterial cells by cutting it up. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, bacterial cells, just like our own cells, plant cells, any cells really, they can be infected by viruses. So this green oval shaped structure that we see at the bottom here, that is a bacteria. So keep in mind the bacteria are really, really small, typically about one tenth to one hundredth the size of our cells, of animal cells. And uh, just like our cells can be infected by a virus, so can bacterial cells. So in the case of this virus here, kind of a meat-shaped virus, it's called a bacteriophage. So this is a virus that specifically targets and infects bacterial cells. Like any viruses though, what they then do is they take over that cell and they turn that cell into a virus factory. So of course the bacteria doesn't want this to happen, just like our cells don't want to become infected and taken over by viruses either. So the way that this virus is going to work is uh, this one happens to be surrounded by a protein coat, this sort of blue squiggly line. That is the DNA that we do have in this particular virus. It's injected into the bacterial cell and then it's going to take over that bacterial cell. So you can think of these restriction enzymes as being a bacterial version of a somewhat primitive immune system in order to protect them against being taken over by this virus. So what these restriction enzymes are going to do is they're going to recognize a very, very specific sequence of DNA that would be found within this viral DNA. And when they find, when they recognize what is called this restriction site or recognition site, they're going to stop and they're going to make a cut. So if we take that DNA and if we cut it, then it is no longer functional. And now this viral DNA, this virus can no longer take over this bacterial cell. Inside of the bacterial cell, uh, bacteria are prokaryotes, they have no internal organelles, and instead of having a long linear chromosome like we have, they have a circular chromosome. So that's what it's showing here is a circular chromosome. So how does the bacteria ensure that its own DNA is not cut by these restriction enzymes? If there does happen to be a restriction site that is recognized by a restriction enzyme on the bacterial chromosome, then um, they do something called methylation. They methylate that site, and that just means that now it's no longer going to be cut by that particular restriction enzyme. 
So I mentioned that these were discovered going way back to the 1960s. There have now been hundreds of different restriction, restriction enzymes that have been discovered coming from many, many different kinds of bacteria. So we'll just run through a few examples on this slide here. So this shows on the uh, right hand side the abbreviations for different kinds of restriction enzymes. The first set of letters here that comes from the bacteria, the abbreviation for the name of the bacteria, and then typically, typically it's the strain of bacteria where it's coming from and uh, when it was discovered. So this one here, the equal R, R is the strain, and five would mean that it is the fifth one from the Escherichia uh, coli R strain that was discovered. So what we see here is it has in these purple blocks so what is called, yes, the recognition sequence. So this is what the enzyme is zipping along the DNA, and this is where it's going to stop, and it's going to make a cut. So one thing that I will point out about these different restriction enzymes is that the sequence of bases that they do take a look at, again, it does typically range, well, it does range between four and eight bases in length. So this one here is four. These two here are six bases in length, and this one here is eight bases in length. There are different kinds of cuts that can be made. Again, it's not just randomly cutting the DNA, it's stopping at these particular recognition sequences, and that's where it's going to make the cut. So some of the cuts, like uh, the two middle ones here, they are what are referred to as blunt cuts. They just cut straight across the DNA and cut it into smaller pieces. These ones here, not all that terribly useful, as we'll see later, but it can cut up the DNA into smaller pieces. The more useful ones, they make what are called these staggered cuts. So this one at the top here, it's going to cut within the sequence here between the A and the G on both of the strands, and that's going to result in what is referred to as a staggered cut. And we'll see on the next slide, it generates what are referred to as sticky ends. I'll also point out here, if we take a look at this one at the bottom, if we take a look at all of these letters in the top strand and read it from left to right, the letters are G, C, G, G, C, C, G, C. If we take a look at the bottom strand and read them in the opposite direction, it's exactly the same. So if you have a word or a phrase that reads the same in both directions, that is what we call a palindrome, and these are all palindromic sequences, which does just mean that the letters read the same in both directions. In this case, they're different strands. So the top strand, G, G, C, C, the bottom strand in the opposite direction, again, GGCC. So again, these are referred to as palindromic sequences that these restriction enzymes, they do recognize. So let's take a look at the most common one here. The most common one that we encounter is this one, the ECOR1. Again, the ECO is the bacteria that it comes from, the Escherichia coli. The R is the strain. And the Roman numeral one means that this is the first of these restriction enzymes that was recognized from this particular strain of the bacteria. So this one recognizes the sequence GAATTC and it makes this staggered cut. So the reason why the staggered cut is so useful is because then what you end up with is these overhanging strands which are single stranded. So because they are single stranded what they actually want to do is they do want to form a bond with the complementary bases. So because they want to form a complementary bond with these ones here, then we refer to these as these sticky ends because they have a tendency to stick together. So we're going to find in the next lesson that I put together uh, with recombinant DNA technologies that this is really, really important to have these restriction enzymes in order to generate these staggered ends, these sticky ends, in order to join DNA together. But we'll leave that for a, another lesson. Um, human DNA, plant DNA, it's made up of these very, very long chromosomes. So if you were to take a single bacterial restriction enzyme and cut human DNA, if this is just one of the chromosomes, the human chromosomes, there would be many, many, many different restriction sites or recognition sites. So one human chromosome would be cut into many, many smaller restriction fragments using one single restriction enzyme. What happens if we throw in two restriction enzymes at the same time? 
Well, if we use a different restriction enzyme, they'll be cut into a different number of pieces. If we use both at the same time, then we get a whole bunch of different restriction fragments. So some of these fragments will be really, really small like this one here. Other ones will be considerably longer. And of course, a whole bunch of other ones that are somewhere in between. So after we've taken the DNA and cut the DNA with restriction enzyme, we want to have some way to kind of organize it and separate out the DNA. And what we want to do is be able to separate the DNA based upon the size. So how do we separate the DNA that's been cut with a restriction enzyme? How do we separate the smaller pieces from the medium-sized pieces and the longer pieces? So it's kind of like using a sieve. So this picture that I have here, sieves with different size holes, would allow us to separate these particles of different size. And that's essentially what we want to do with the DNA. Only we can't use something like these sieves, at least not these ones here, because DNA is much, much smaller. But there is another kind of sieve that we can use, and the process that is the second technology that you need to know about that is called gel electrophoresis. So for gel electrophoresis, what do we need for equipment? Um, the electro is referring to an electrical supply. So this here, is a power pack. It plugs into an AC receptacle and what it does though is it converts it into direct current. So gel electrophoresis only works with direct current so it's moving only in one single direction is what that is referring to. What we have at the bottom here this is called an electrophoresis chamber. It's a plastic box which is filled with a conducting fluid and in the middle here what we have this sort of square plate it is called a stage and it's on this stage where we're going to have a jello-like substance which is the gel and it's this gel that's serving the same role as these sieves. It is the gel that's going to serve as a molecular sieve. So the idea is you're going to create these tiny little depressions that are called wells at one end and it's in these tiny tiny little depressions that you're going to add your sample of DNA that you cut with a restriction enzyme. So again, in your sample, you have DNA that's been cut into all these smaller pieces. And the idea is we want to separate out these portions of DNA based upon their size. And this is what is going to allow us to do that. So now when we turn the current on, not only is the fluid conductive, but the gel is conductive and the DNA that we placed inside of here has a negative charge. So what that means is because it has a negative charge, it's going to migrate in the direction of anything that has a positive charge. So when we get the current going through here, this is going to be the negative end of the electrophoresis chamber. This is going to be the positive end of the electrophoresis chamber. So as soon as you turn the current on, that DNA is going to move through the gel in this direction. But this gel is a molecular sieve, which means smaller pieces of DNA, they can travel fairly easily through the gel. Pieces of DNA of medium length, they won't travel quite as quickly. And ones that are much, much bigger, they'll take even longer to travel through the gel. So we can separate out the DNA based upon its size using this gel electrophoresis. So this is looking down on that stage. So this would be our gel-like material that's sitting in the electrophoresis chamber. So again, it's in these little depressions here. Those are referred to as the wells. And it's in there where we're going to use this, which is a micropipette. And inside of the micropipette, we have our restriction enzyme digested DNA. So we apply it into the different depressions and the idea behind having different depressions is that maybe it's coming from different samples of DNA or maybe you cut them with different restriction enzymes. And again, it does show here that this is the negative end at the top. This is the positive end at the bottom. And because DNA does have a negative charge due to the phosphates, it will move in this direction. This process also works with other um, molecules besides DNA, so proteins could be separated in this fashion as well. If there is something, a protein that did happen to have a positive charge, it would actually move in the opposite direction. 
but DNA, negative charge, so again, it will all move toward the positive end of the electrophoresis chamber. Again, the whole point is to separate out the DNA. So this one here is showing a vertical rather than a horizontal electrophoresis chamber, but same sort of idea. You put your sample at the top and here it just migrates down toward the positive end. So this is kind of nice because it's showing this porous gel, which is the molecular sieve. And it's really just made up of uh, protein, which is these long, long strands of protein. And that's what's going to slow down or retard the movement of the molecule. So here it says the protein mixture, but for us, it's not going to be protein. It is going to be a DNA uh, section, a portion of DNA, which has been digested with the restriction enzymes. But same sort of principle here. They're just using these circles to represent different sizes. So these ones here would be very small. They travel the furthest. These ones here, they will be of medium size. They end up somewhere in the middle. And these ones here don't travel very far because they're much, much larger than the other ones. So just a couple of more pictures, really just emphasizing the same thing. So again, the direction of the movement toward the negative end. The whole point is to separate the DNA based on size. That is the point of the gel electrophoresis. And we end up with the larger ones at the top. We end up with the smaller ones at the bottom. It's really as simple as that. So if we take a look at this one right here, what that means is we get a whole bunch of different sections of DNA. And this one here would be the smallest one, a whole bunch sort of in the middle. This one would be the largest one. Everything else is somewhere in between. So in reality, this is what a true electrophoresis gel does look like after you take it out and visualize it. Quite often, when we want to do um, that sort of thing or any other analysis of DNA, uh, we don't have enough DNA, so we need to make more of it. And that's what the point of this polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is going to accomplish. Overall, it's going to allow us to take a small amount of DNA and make a whole bunch of DNA. So the way that this procedure works, and this was um, discovered in the 1980s by someone by the name of Kerry Mullis, who did later receive the Nobel Prize in chemistry for the polymerase chain reaction. This is the way that it works. Um, unlike DNA replication, which this is really doing the same as, um, so the polymerase is referring to the DNA polymerase enzyme, which is for the replication of the DNA. So that's really what we're doing is DNA replication, only it's taking place in the test tube. And it's not the entire chromosome or all of the chromosomes that are being replicated. It's only a portion of it. So it's showing in this picture here that this is the sequence that is to be amplified. And what that means by the amplification is you're making a whole bunch of copies. What do I mean by a whole bunch of copies? Billions of copies and in the matter of a few hours or a couple of days. So how does it work? <clears throat> well, we take the chromosome. This is the section of DNA again between these lines that we want to amplify. And to separate the DNA double helix to break those hydrogen bonds that are holding the complementary strands together, all we need to do is heat it up. So I have the steps at the side here as well. Heat the, sam heat the sample up to 95 degrees Celsius. And that simply causes the two complementary strands to separate. Now, we don't want to replicate the entire DNA. So what you do is you throw in some primers. Remember that for DNA polymerase to work, you do need to have a short section of double-stranded DNA. So we throw in the primers that are called flanking primers. So these flanking primers, they flank, or they're at either end of that section of DNA that we want to replicate. We're not interested in everything else on the outside of it. We only want to replicate this section here. And that's the idea behind having these um, flanking primers. Uh, temperature has dropped down to 55, so they're able to stick to the complementary bases on these template strands. Now we're going to throw in the enzyme, the DNA polymerase, but our DNA polymerase works at human body temperature mammalian body temperature, which is 37 to about 37 degrees Celsius. 
But what we want is an enzyme that can work at a hotter temperature. So what in fact they found is this enzyme here, which doesn't come from humans. In fact, it doesn't come from animals or plants. It comes from bacteria that you find in hot springs. This is their natural environment. TAQ stands for Thermus aquaticus. That is the name of the bacteria from hot springs. They do the same thing as our cells do. They replicate the DNA, their own DNA, only they do it at a much hotter temperature. So Kerry Mullis, when he came up with his procedure, he didn't discover the TAC polymerase, but he just kind of thought, hey, that would be kind of useful for amplifying the DNA. So if we go back to the pictures, this is what the TAC polymerase is doing. It's bringing in all the complementary bases. So now we filled in that space. We started with one, now we have two. What are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna repeat over and over again. So after we do the same thing again, then we have four. Then you repeat it again and you have eight. In other words, what we have is an exponential increase in the number of the DNA molecules that we have for this particular section of DNA that we're interested in amplifying. That is what the polymerase chain reaction accomplishes. So this shows us here, this is our original DNA template strand. And after 35 cycles, this is about a day, takes place in what is called a thermal cycler. In fact, this is probably kind of an old picture of a thermal cycler. Automatically takes the DNA through all of these steps here and just repeats it over and over and over again. And take a look at the number that we have here, a huge, huge number, 68 billion, is what you have after 35 cycles. 68 billion copies of that section of DNA that we were interested in amplifying. So now let's tie together some of these different technologies. So DNA fingerprinting is another technology that goes back to uh, the 1980s. So initially it did use those restriction enzymes and it used gel electrophoresis and it would also have used polymerase chain reaction. So DNA fingerprinting, for example, can be used from a, uh, for a crime scene investigation and it can be from a hair sample, it can be from a tissue sample, um, any cells containing the DNA, it can be used um, using those cells. So typically the first thing that has to happen is you need to make a whole bunch of it. So you use the polymerase chain reaction in order to make many copies. When they initially came up with the first DNA fingerprinting, they used restriction enzymes. They don't use it anymore, so I won't talk about that procedure. And then what they do is they use that gel electrophoresis. So all three of those different technologies that I just talked about is what they did initially use for the early DNA fingerprinting technology. So how does it work? Well, DNA fingerprinting, as I have here, is based on the fact that Unless you have an identical twin, every single person in the world, they have their own unique genetic makeup. No other person in the world has the same order of the A's, the T's, the G's, and the C's as you have. If we were to take a look at, for example, though, a specific protein, let's say the protein for your digestive system that makes the enzyme amylase. Chances are pretty much everyone actually has exactly the same genetic makeup for making that enzyme. But there's a whole section of DNA that is non-coding. So we know that coding DNA, DNA that's used to make proteins, it's only about 5% of the DNA. So the remaining 95% were slowly starting to piece together what it does but a whole bunch of it is non-coding, which means it doesn't actually code for proteins, and it's different. It's highly variable from person to person, and that is the key. They're not taking a look at DNA fingerprinting at the coding region, because if we were to take a look at that, we are truly 99.9% .9 genetically identical in terms of that coding information. So they need to take a look at the non-coding information in the DNA. So a couple of things that they um, look at. Um, so a couple of them that I have here, variable nucleotide tan repeats, VNTRs, and the other ones are called STRs. These are the ones that they use now. So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures rather than trying to explain verbally what these are. So these are sections of the non-coding portion of the DNA. Um, they 
possibly don't have any function whatsoever. And um, they have been repeated a variable number of times in different individuals. And that's where this one here, VNTR, or variable nucleotide tandem repeats. So these blocks that they show, so this is representing a chromosome. This line is one chromosome. This would be the other chromosome in that same individual. So remember that you have two copies of each chromosome. So let's just say that this one here is the chromosome that came from the person's mother. This is the one that came from the person's father. Well, their mother and father aren't genetically identical, so the chromosomes won't be identical. And if we take a look at this particular VNTR, all of these letters and many more, typically they range from about 17 to 40 bases, we see that on the chromosome that this individual got from their mother, it's been repeated 12 times. The chromosome that they got from their father, it's been repeated 17 times. So this is where we get the idea that for this particular chunk of DNA, um, each person is probably going to be a little bit different in terms of the number of times that this VNTR has been repeated. What they do look at now is something very similar, but a little bit different. They are short tandem repeats, and they're just shorter sections of repeated DNA, very similar to up above, only now they're only about four bases in length. So exactly the same thing, we can see that on this chromosome here, there are seven repeats of it, and on this one here, there are eight repeats of it. So this is now what is used for modern DNA fingerprinting, are these short tandem repeats. So let's say it is a crime scene investigation. This is our crime scene DNA. So if we take a look at one of the chromosomes from the crime scene, um, the two different chromosomes that make up that particular pair, and on one of the chromosomes, we see that there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the repeats that we have here. They don't just take a look at one short tandem repeat to make it accurate, they need to take a look at many more. And in fact, for crime scene investigations, they look at 13 different short tandem repeats. And I can't remember what the number is, but the chances of two individuals just by chance having exactly the same DNA fingerprint looking at 13 different short tandem repeats is in the one in trillions. So in other words, virtually impossible. So yeah, from the crime scene DNA for this short tandem repeat, there are seven repeats for this one. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the repeats. If we take a look at the suspect, then here we have seven. So you might say, yeah, that person's guilty. But remember, they don't just take a look at one. They take a look at 13. So if we take a look at this one here, we can see that, well, now this is not eight repeats. So that would mean that even taking a look at these two different short tandem repeats, that means that this suspect is then not going to be the guilty party. At least their DNA doesn't match the crime scene DNA. So I just have here more or less the uh, procedure that I did tell you about is they first need to have a sample of the DNA, whatever that sample is coming from. They need to make a whole bunch of it using polymerase chain reaction they need to use gel electrophoresis and then take a look at the pattern that they see which is a barcode like pattern that they see in the gel which is for the short tandem repeats and that is the dna fingerprint so if we take a look at uh, this kind of simple picture here showing three different individuals and it's saying that the length of the short tandem repeat so i don't know if they're talking about the overall length of it or the number of repeats, it doesn't really matter, but here it's 250 for that short tandem repeat and 100 of this one. So if we take a look at that person's DNA fingerprint, both of these are pretty small, so they travel quite a ways down through the gel when we do the gel electrophoresis. If we take a look at this individual here, this one's pretty big, this one's somewhere in the middle. And then this one here for the third individual, a really big one, so it stays close to the top, but they also have the smallest in terms of the length for this other short tandem repeat, and that one goes to the bottom. So taking a look at here, again, it's only two short tandem repeats that we're looking at. So that is the greenish colored one and the bluish colored one. 
and this would then be the DNA fingerprint for these two individuals. And we can simply see that the barcode-like pattern, it's different because they do have their own unique DNA and their DNA fingerprint. So if this were a crime scene investigation, this is the way that it would kind of lay out. So this is our crime scene where we collected the sample, the blood stain. So from that, we would um, retrieve the DNA, again, amplify the DNA, and then we would run the gel, taking a look at the short can of repeats. And this is the pattern that we get in the first column here. So it's as simple as this, really. These are our suspects. So we're trying to figure out who is the guilty party. Whose ever fingerprint matches up with the crime scene, well, at least according to this, is going to be the guilty party. So it's just a matter of matching up the bars. So if we take a look at Bob, well, these two match up, but then the next one doesn't. So Bob is okay. He's not guilty. If we take a look at Sue, um, well, what happened? This one doesn't match up, so it can't be Sue. Let's take a look at John, okay? Uh, that one matches up. That one matches up, matches up. So when we take a look at all of the bars for John and for the blood stain, they do match up. And for Lisa, we can see that they don't match up. So according to this, it's John. That would then be the guilty party because his DNA fingerprint matches up with the crime scene DNA. It can also be used for paternity suits. So the picture at the right hand side here. So this is taking a look at, um, it looks just one single, one short tandem repeat that we're taking a look at here. So this one here does go along with the picture at the bottom. So it says that the male, so this is the father that we're taking a look at here, and this is the mother. Again, each one has two copies of each chromosome that they in turn got from their father and their mother. So if we take a look at this short tandem repeat in the male, there are six copies and there are four copies. So if we were to do a fingerprint, this is what it would look like. And this is what it looks like down here as well. And for mom, this is what her fingerprint would look like. <clears throat> so other children, the children either need to get the bar from the father or from the mother. Okay, so if we take a look at this boy here, this one here came from dad, this one here came from mom, so that is their child, this one here, this one came from mom, this band came from dad, that's their child, other daughter, this one came from dad, this one came from mom, that one's good, and the last son, this one came from dad, this one from mom, so that is also their child. So if we did have, let me just draw another one in here, let's say that we have a band that is right here, and then we have another one that's right here. Okay, so we can see that this one came from mom, but this one didn't come from dad. So it's usually pretty obvious who the mom is. That's the one that gives birth. But it's maybe not always so clear who the father is. So this then would indicate that, unfortunately, this is not the child of this father here. It would have to have been another father. And yeah, so huge societal issues related to these technologies. So things like DNA databases, storing DNA information, how will that DNA information be used? Can it be used for discrimination? Can it be used for racial profiling? And some other abuses that might result as well. So that'll be it for the DNA technology so far. And like I said, I'll put together another lesson which is going to be on the remaining ones, recombinant DNA technology, genetic engineering, and gene therapy.